Hey guys, so now that we're done talking about derivatives, which is considered the first part of calculus, which is considered differential calculus, we're going to go ahead and talk about the antiderivative, which is doing everything a derivative does, but backwards, right? And I'm about to explain exactly what that means. And that is the introduction and the beginning of integral calculus, which is the second part of calculus. We break it up calculus into differential calculus, which is for derivatives, and integral calculus, which is for antiderivatives or integrals. So let's go ahead and get started. So here we have the notation for the antiderivative is going to be a capital F. So whenever we are normally talking about functions, we normally have a little f, like a lowercase f like this. But now when we talk about the antiderivative, we're going to talk about its capital F. Then we also say that you can check an antiderivative by computing the derivative, right? So now that we're taking antiderivatives, which means that we're going to go backwards into our we're going to go backwards in the derivative process. We're going to com compute the antiderivative. We can check if we did it right by computing the derivative, and it should give you the original function that you started off with, right? And you guys will see exactly what I mean by that in just a second. So what are these antiderivatives used for, right? So the reason why we have to use antiderivatives is because sometimes in calculus we're given rates, right? Like was the rate of this is blank, right? And then we want to find the original function, right? Like what is the original function? For example, a nice application of it would be like if I give you velocity, which is a rate, right? Velocity is a change in position over time. I want to find actually the position formula. How do I do that? Well, if I have the velocity function and I take the antiderivative, that means I'm going to go backwards to the original function. And you go from position to velocity, right? So if we're going to go backwards, we're going to go from velocity to position. And that is the exact point of antiderivatives, to go backwards. And I'm going to have a whole different video on just velocity and acceleration and all that stuff. So no worries about that. I just want to give you an example of why we use antiderivatives, right? So here we have, they're used to find the blank function when given the derivative, right? So we can see it as if we're given velocity, to find the blank function will be the original function the original function, and that would be our, our position formula, POS for our position, right? So we can go from velocity to position, which means going from the derivative to the antiderivative, right? And there's one last thing where we're computing antiderivatives, right? And it is not to forget, to do not forget to add a, a C, which is a random constant that we're going to talk about at the end of your antiderivative, right? So that means that if I'm going from, if I'm going from F, which is the original function, to the antiderivative, right? To the antiderivative, I need to always make sure to add a plus c. And you'll ask, why do I even have a plus c, right? And the reason why is because if I were to take a derivative, right? If I were to take the derivative of this, right? Which is the f, capital F, which is the antiderivative plus c, when I derive a constant, it is going to be zero, right? So we always need to account for this random constant that we can derive to get zero. So now that we've talked about the notation of antiderivative, which is going to be the capital F, we should talk about how does an antiderivative relate to an integral, right? Because a lot of times antiderivatives is the first name you hear, but you never actually hear about antiderivatives ever again. From now on, you're always going to hear about integrals, right? So we're going to talk about how to go from an antiderivative, an antiderivative to an integral, which is going to be the more common notation and term that we're going to refer to antiderivatives and calculus, right? After this video, I'm probably never going to say antiderivative again, and I'm just going to focus on saying integral. Find the integral of this, not no longer find the antiderivative of this. And I'm actually asking you to do the same exact thing, right? So a lot of times where here I'm just telling you to go from f of f of x to its antiderivative, right? Which is going to be capital F. You go from lowercase to capital F, and then you're just going to be like, and then you add a plus c, right? But there's another way that I can ask you that. And I want you guys to get really familiar with this notation because after I just kind of introduce it to you guys lightly, what an antiderivative is in this video, we're going to go and use this notation forever on. And that is going to be the integral sign. And that is going to look like this, right? So an integral sign is going to be like this. And that is telling you to find the antiderivative or the integral. And when I'm asking you to find the integral of f of x, right, or the antiderivative of f of x, you're going to give me the capital F, which is going to be the antiderivative plus c, right? So you, I can tell you find the antiderivative, or I can just tell you a little squiggly sign in front of f of x, and that is me asking you to find integral, okay, or antiderivative. It's the same thing, okay? 
So now let's go ahead and talk about some of the antiderivatives before we actually do some examples, right? So if we go ahead and talk about these antiderivatives, right? And we'll talk about this box in just a second. I can tell you that some of the rules of antiderivatives are going to be very similar to the rules of derivatives, right? So you're doing the same thing, right? Except now we're going backwards. So the first two boxes are going to talk about the rules. And these are not all the rules. These are just, just some of the rules that we're going to talk about. So the idea is that if you have a constant in front of your function and I ask you to find the antiderivative, you can just multiply the, the constant times the antiderivative itself, right? So the same idea of being able to take out a constant, the constant doesn't really affect your antiderivative, where you're finding the antiderivative of or the integral of is going to be of the function. You don't worry about the constant. The constant has no value to you. Another thing is that when two different functions are adding or subtracting, we can even add a little minus here. We can even add a little minus here. The, the antiderivative or the integral is going to be equal to the antiderivative of the first function plus the antiderivative of the second function, right? So it's going to be plus or minus, right? So whether you're adding or subtracting, doesn't matter. They both apply. So those are the main two rules that we're going to be using when talking about antiderivatives. Then let's talk about some actual antiderivative, right? Let's talk about actually going backwards. So here I have C, which is just a regular constant. The antiderivative is going to be CX. And not just CX is going to be CX plus C. Remember to always add a plus C after your antiderivative, right? And the reason why the antiderivative of C, which is a constant, right? Let's put a constant here. Constant is CX because, for example, let's say C was 7, right? We're trying to find the antiderivative of 7. Well, what equation or what function, if I take the derivative of it, will give me 7? Well, 7x. If I have 7x and I take the derivative of 7x, what is the what is the derivative of 7x? That would be 7, right? So it would be the constant, the constant that we're talking about. And li very likely, if I take the antiderivative of 7, I should get 7x plus c. So that's the idea, right? We're always kind of thinking about going backwards. So let's talk about, you know, this right here, the polynomial can relate to the power rule, right? So before, when we had x to the n to take a derivative, we would take a power rule, which means that we brought down the n and we subtracted 1. But if we're going backwards, instead of subtracting 1, we're actually going to add 1. And instead of multiplying by the n, we're going to be dividing by n plus 1 now, right? So everything's backwards. If before for the power rule, we would, we would multiply and subtract, here we're going to add and divide everything is backwards so and then remember that you have your antiderivative and it's going to be plus one all right that's the idea now this this anti-power rule that we can call this anti-power rule only works for one scenario i mean only does not work for one scenario and that is when n is equal to negative one or when you have one over x which is x to the negative which is the same thing as x to the negative one right so whenever you have this scenario the anti-power doesn't work because the, the antiderivative of 1 over x is ln of x, right? ln of x plus c. Let's not forget that. So that means that if I ever have to take the derivative of ln of x, that would give me 1 over x. So you guys see how you can always check, you can always check your antiderivative by computing a derivative and see you can go backwards. So here's the beauty. If you have, here's like the, one of the easier antiderivatives or derivatives. If you're deriving e to the x, or, or taking the antiderivative of e to the x, it is still going to be e to the x. That is real nice. Then, you always never forget to put your plus c. Let's scroll up and see some more. So sine of x, here is where, when we took derivatives of, of trigonometric functions, we, talk about, we talked about the three c's rule, right? Well, now we're going backwards. So it's no longer going to apply to the three C's. It's going to be the opposite to the three functions that don't have a C, right? So this is going to be like the opposite, opposite of three C's rule, right? So in this case, if I was taking the, the derivative of sine, the antiderivative would not be negative. The derivative wouldn't be negative. If I was taking the derivative of sine, the derivative wouldn't be negative. But here I'm taking the antiderivative of sine. So since sine doesn't have a C, it, its antiderivative is actually negative. So the antiderivative of sine is going to be negative cosine plus c.
So this is an opposite of a three C's rule. It's gonna be a real easy way to remember. And let's say we wanted to check this, right? What is the derivative of cosine? Well, the derivative of cosine is negative sine because it is th it's a three C's rule, but it's a negative cosine. So the derivative of a negative cosine is going to be negative and a negative, which are going to cancel to be a positive sign. So here we go. If we're taking a derivative of, if we're taking a derivative of cosine, it's not a C's rule, so it's going to go ahead and get a, it's going to go ahead and get a sign. So we're good to go. And then lastly, if we have the, the, the derivative of the antiderivative of tangent, I mean of secant squared, it is going to give you tangent, and that is because the derivative of the derivative of a tangent is secant squared. So there we go. So now let's go ahead and do some examples on this stuff, right? So real simple. What if I had to do, what if I had to do the antiderivative, if I gave you five, right? And I asked you to do the antiderivative or the F or the capital F of F, right? So that's the same example that I gave you guys about the seven, right? So if I have five, which applies to the constant rule, I am just going to go ahead and get my antiderivative or my capital F is going to be five X, right? And let's say I wasn't sure and I'm not done because it's five X plus C. Okay. And let's say I wanted to check it. I would just take the derivative. I would just take the derivative. I'm actually going to do that in blue so we can show that we're checking, right? And that is where this part comes in, right? That the derivative, the derivative of your antiderivative gives you your original function. They just cancel out. Derivatives and antiderivatives cancel out. So the derivative of 5x is going to be 5, and the derivative of any constant is going to be 0, so it is not going to matter. So you guys see how our derivative of our antiderivative gives us our original function that we started with. And that is the whole point of antiderivatives. The good thing is that now you can always check your antiderivatives because you know derivatives, right? So the stronger you are with derivatives, the easier antiderivative is going to be. So let's go and see another example. Here in example two, where we have where we have f of x of x squared minus e to the x, right? So in this case, we're going to we're going to use the the second rule where we have two different functions subtracting. We can just take their antiderivatives and subtract them together, right? So let's go ahead and do that. So my f of x, my capital F, which means my antiderivative of x squared. Remember, usually I would have to, if I was using derivatives, I would have to multiply by the exponent, multiply by the exponent, and then subtract by 1. But here I'm going backwards, right? So first, I'm going to use my rule right here. I'm going to add 1 to the exponent. So it's going to be 2 plus 1, 2 plus 1, and then I'm going to divide by that number, which is 2 plus 1, right? Then I'm going to put a minus here in the middle, and I'm going to take the antiderivative of my second function here, which is e to the x, which that means that I'm just going to use this right here, which is going to be e to the x, right? And I cannot forget my plus c. Now I'm just going to do a little bit of cleanup, just a little bit of cleanup, and I'm going to have f, f of x is going to be x to the 3 divided by 3 minus e to the x plus c, right? So now that I'm done with that, I am going to go ahead and take the derivative of it to check it. I'm going to go ahead and check it out and see if it's the same by taking the derivative. And if I take the derivative of x to the third over 3, it's going to be 3x squared over 3 minus, well, e to the x, the derivative is also e to the x, so it doesn't matter. And the derivative of any constant just goes away, so I don't care about that. And you guys see that if I clean this up just a little bit more, I cancel out those threes, I am going to go ahead and get x squared minus e to the x, which is my original function that I started with. So you can always check antiderivatives, and that is the beauty of it, right? This is just a soft introduction to see how you guys can always check everything. And then we'll get into like the real variations in every type of antiderivative or integral. Because here I'm just kind of going over some, just softly introduce it, and then we're going to go real deep into all the different types and little tricks here and there that you can do. All right, which the tricks and the tricks that you can do in integration or antiderivatives are going to be very similar to the tricks that you do in derivatives. So here I tell you to find f of x, which is the, the equivalent of my original function, giving you the derivative, right? So that's the idea. If I give you the derivative, find my original function. So what I need to do is I need to find the integration of the integration of the antiderivative 
of x squared minus 1 over x. Well, here's the deal. I don't have any rules for division that I gave you, right? I don't. But what I could do is just how when I have derivatives, I can manipulate this so I can try to use it, right? So what I'm saying here is that I am going to go ahead and split it up. So let me go ahead and do that. So I'm going to have x squared over x minus 1 over x. So I went ahead and split that up. So I can simplify it just a little bit. So I'm going to get x squared over x is just x, and this is just 1 over x. So now I need to go ahead and take the antiderivative of this new function that I have. I'm going to go ahead and do that in blue. But the antiderivative of the derivative is going to be the original. So I'm going to go ahead and take the antiderivative of x, which the antiderivative of x, I'm just going to treat as an x to the 1, in which I add 1 to the exponent, right? So 1 plus 1, and then I divide by that number. Always remember to add 1 to the exponent and then divide by whatever number that is. And then the last thing I need to do here is just have 1 over x, which means that I need to look for the rule of 1 over x. See, I would like to bring this up as x to the negative 1, but I can't because that is the one exception to antiderivatives, right? Whenever I have 1 over x or 1 over a variable, the way that I'm going to find the antiderivative or the integration of that, it's going to be by using ln of x, right? So we're going to use ln of x. So it's going to be minus ln of x. And then I cannot forget my plus c. So now I'm going to go ahead and play some cleanup in which I'm going to have x to the 2 over 2 minus ln of x plus c. All right, so I'm completely nicely done with my antiderivative, but I'm not done yet because I need to go ahead and check it. So let me go ahead and take the derivative of this, right? So let me go ahead and take the derivative of, of, of my f of x, right? And I should get my, I should get my original function my x minus 1 over x. So the derivative of this right here is going to be 2x over 2. And the derivative of ln of x is just 1 over x. So these two cancel. And then my derivative gives me x minus 1 over x. Right? So therefore, what I have right here matches what I have, what I have right here. Therefore, I did my antiderivative correctly, right? So that's the beauty of antiderivatives. You can go ahead and check them yourself, right? So now we're going to go ahead and talk about actual integrals and talk about all the different types of integrals or indefinite integrals, right? Which means that you just have the squiggly and we have nothing else on it. We have no numbers on it. That's the difference between an, an, an indefinite integral and a definite integral. But we'll talk about that in just a bit. Let's go ahead and do some practice problems. So see you guys next time.